Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Eli back with you on the AAMFT podcast. You know, what is your biggest fear as a practitioner of systemic therapy? You know, I know for me, being in the field 20 years, it was always getting called into court. My job as a relational healer is to kind of reduce conflict, build connection. And, you know, to, to me, the court system has had a, the reverse connotation. So whether you are a student young into the profession, a preclinical fellow on the way to licensure, or you've been practicing a long time. This episode of the podcast is for you. We've collected uh, kind of a list of the biggest questions, gray areas, ethical dilemmas, all about interfacing with the court in the legal system as a practitioner of systemic therapy. Because you know, when you're dealing with multiple people in the room, systems, couples or families, there's a lot more going on clinically and potentially legally. So today uh, we're going to interview Stephanie Frank. She is a former legal counsel at AAMFT with a wealth of knowledge and really the most frequently asked questions. I've been collecting them from students and practitioners for about the last year and we finally got to sit down and get some of these answered. So this is one that even if you've been practicing a long time, I guarantee you, you will learn something. After that, I'm going to be back to tell you all about the member benefits as far as legal and ethical consultations you can get by being a member of the AAMFT. Eli, back here with you on the AAMFT podcast. I'm so pleased to be joined by AAMFT legal counsel, Stephanie Frank. So today we're talking about something very important. It's nobody wants to get involved with the legal system, I believe, if you're a therapist, whether young or old. But part of uh, an ethical practice is knowing about how an MFT interfaces with the court system. So St- Stephanie has been so nice to give us an hour to talk about what every kind of MFT should know. And I guess the first question, you are our first guest uh, that has not been involved with couple or family therapy directly as a clinician or researcher. So talk to us about your job with the AMFT. And I think this is a, a second or third career for you. So tell us how you got into being a lawyer and what you did before. Before this, I was, before I was a lawyer, I was a teacher. I taught middle school. I taught uh, language arts as well as television production, and I also taught the college level, uh, English 101, human- basic humanities classes, public speaking, basically anything they thought I was qualified for, they, they put me in a classroom. Uh, prior to that, I was in TV and film production. That was my, my undergrad. And I worked for HBO Sports. I did some, I worked for um, Fashion Weeks, that kind of thing. I worked for a broadcast graphic de- design house um, and all of that. And it, it seems like it's not linear, <laughs> mm-hmm. but in my mind it is um, all connected. And then I went back to law school. So before AMFT, I was working at a regulatory uh, monitoring firm and a regulatory and legislative monitoring firm. And I worked on the regulatory side. What was your background in mental health before you started working with the AMFT as far as kind of learning all the specifics about law and uh, the court system as it involves, you know, working with therapists? I learned on the job. I did not know um, that much about that. I know the generalities of law and how it interacts 
with professions in general because they they teach us that generally in law school. But it was my predecessor, Amanda Reeves, who some of you I'm sure know, um, as well as Roger Smith, the director of our department, provided me with the information, the research that I needed to read, what I needed to look into to be more tailored and specific to MFTs and mental health. Um, And it was just really interesting, really fascinating to learn about. Um, You know, I was so focused more on I want to be in house counsel. And the fact that I do do that sort of thing. I deal with our contracts and, and I deal with our intellectual property portfolio. I deal with that. Um, boring for you guys, I'm sure. But then there was this whole consultation helping the members. And I think that's probably, if not my favorite, one of my favorite parts of this position, because at the end of the day, that's how I get to help people. So that to me is one of the biggest benefits for being a member. Obviously, people who listen to this podcast have some interest in systemic therapies. They're not necessarily a member of the AMFT, but membership does have its benefits. So we'll start. Today, we're going to talk about these commonly asked questions we get about MFTs inter- interfacing with the court system. Um, but, but first, uh, it's always good to know what you get with the AMFT legal and ethical consultation. So if you are a member, student, preclinical fellow, fellow, uh, clinical fellow, what does an MFT uh, legal consultation involve and what does it not include? Sure. So we, um, if you're a student member, you're eligible for ethics consultations only, which basically if you come across an ethical dilemma and you need to talk it out. You can give me a call, send me an email, um, and I can help you based on our code of ethics. I will refer to our code of ethics, talk it out. What's the thought process? What are the different options? Um, I'm never going to directly say you should do this. Um, it's going to be, well, here are the options, and you're going to have to make an educated decision. And I always advise I'm not the only person they should talk to their liability insurer, supervisors, peers, and as much information as you can gather to make an educated decision is always the best. Uh, Preclinical fellows, clinical fellows are entitled to ethics and legal. Um, That's where you get the subpoena. You can call me uh, to help you work on next steps, figure out what process you need to go through. Um, What it doesn't include is I'm only barred in Virginia. So if you're calling me from another state, I can't interpret state law for you. Um, I can direct you to it. I can find it. Sometimes they'll call me and a member will call and just say, I can't find this law and I can find it for them and, and send it along. Sometimes they'll call me and say, I know I need my own attorney, but I don't know what to ask them. I don't know what to, how to convey what I need from them. And I can help them through that process as well. So I get a, a variety of calls from multiple relationships, subpoenas, general business, should I get an LLC, should I not have an LLC? It it ranges very much the consultations that I get. And it is unlimited as of right now. If you are an AMFT member. Do you hear from some people multiple times? Yes. Yes. Uh Yes. Sometimes it's the same issue that just comes across over months. Sometimes different things come up. And once they realize they have the resource, a lot of people tend to use it a little bit more. Um, emailing, you can actually book a call with me. There's a, a website um, where you can actually it's directly link to my calendar. So you can actually book a call with me, probably the best way, because otherwise my voicemail box gets backed up. We'll go over well. that at the end as well, yeah, but that's absolutely. all through amft.org, right? You can go through the yes. main site and, and, mm-hmm. and find that. Uh, so we're going to talk about specifically interfacing with the courts what are the as far as those categories of calls you get um, for the legal where do they cluster as far as what are you seeing the most in your your first couple of years with amft what people call about most common business and practice issues subpoenas uh, requests for records um, a little bit of online therapy has been growing uh, obviously a big to-do. 
multiple relationships. I don't know if I mentioned that. Those those are generally where things fall. Yeah, well, let's, let's cover all of those today. So um, these are, in no particular order, a, a list that we have been getting. And certainly, as someone that teaches an ethics and professional development class, I get a lot of these too. And I find I like teaching a class because, you know, laws change, ethical codes change. And this is not something, you know, if you're a more experienced practitioner and you haven't been in graduate school for a while, you still have an ethical responsibility to stay up to date with this. And I, I'm knocking on wood because in 20 years of practice, I have kind of stayed out of a, a court situation. And I think most uh, professionals, uh, LMFTs, would like to do that. But we'll also talk today about some that if you are, if you like being an expert witness. Uh, and I guess let's just start about that. Uh, let's talk about how... Uh, an, ex an expert witness is different um, from a, a factual witness. Sure. So an expert witness is, it could be a variety of different things. An expert witness is if you are asked to testify on your specific knowledge of a specific disorder. Um, so you're not directly related to a plaintiff or a defendant. You are just, I'm here to explain this disorder. That's a factual uh, expert witness. If you are a forensic evaluator and you were hired by one of the parties to forensic evaluations can be done in numerous things. The most common is custody. Um, because a, a, if you are a treating therapist, you cannot give a recommendation to the court on, on residency or custody of a minor. A third part, but you can, if you're the forensic evaluator, that's your job. In, and as a forensic evaluator, you interview all parties involved, observe the minor in different situations, and come up. I've gone to sessions where they say their reports range from 100 to 400 pages, very in-depth. And, and you are an expert witness there because you have done this evaluation. Evaluations are also done on accident cases, on, on, on employment, uh, wrongful termination cases, um, uh, malpractice cases. So those are where therapists voluntarily use their expert knowledge to assist in a case. That's probably the best way to describe it. Yes. And how, how would one, this is something that, again, if, if you want to get into this work, you're probably uh, have some time under your belt. You're probably known in your community and you're not necessarily an academic, but you certainly have been doing this for a while. It, are there best practices for expert witnesses? Um, and if somebody wants to get into that, how would you recommend them preparing themselves as far as, you know, knowing, you know, what, to, what the rules are and what to say and what not to say? Knowing the area, um, that you're working on getting involved with uh, probably law firms and advertising yourself with them, um, offering yourself as an expert witness uh, on cases. And it, it, a lot of people do it as, you know, side. It doesn't have to be your main thing. It could be something on the side that you also do if you enjoy it. I would say, you know, join a, an additional professional organization that deals specifically yes. with that as well someone is an expert witness or and they're a member of amft are they allowed they're allowed to say they are a member um uh, what and are they are allowed to reference the uh, amft code of ethics i would imagine but they they do not ever kind of speak for all marriage and family therapists they speak as a a member not as a what what amft would think or, or right exactly it would be their own personal it wouldn't be representing amft but it would just be part of their credentials, just like their, you know, masters or doctoral credentials, licensure credentials. I think the thing that everybody fears uh, is getting a subpoena, and sometimes, uh, whether it was covered in graduate school or not, or you're a young professional, I think the immediate uh, uh, response is uh, maybe one of fear or anxiety, and and to comply immediately. So. Tell us when, uh, and this is where knowing the rules and your rights are very important, because just if a lawyer tells you something, it, it does not necessarily mean they know your profession or your code of ethics uh, better than you do. So when you get a subpoena, give us some tips as what you should do and what you should not do. Sure. This is probably one of the number one questions I get 
It's very, it could be very nerve wracking if, if you've never gotten one before. Um, sometimes therapists will get asked for the records and they say, you know, they'll, they'll tell them no and they'll be like, okay, then we'll subpoena you. And therapists get very scared at that. But I say, no, you want that. You want that paper trail. You want that, that acknowledgement to the court of who you are and what you are doing um, is, is actually a good thing. So when you get a subpoena, you definitely want to let your client know you received it. You want to read it. Um, and I don't mean just skim because there could be very detailed things in there. Now, most of the time it's a blank, you know, a blanket subpoena that they send to everybody. It'll say, we want all your medical records, including x-rays. And, and, and you're like, what, what, you know, why are they asking me for x-rays? Because it's just a standard language type of form. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very specific. So you're going to want to read it. You want to know what they're asking for. Um, if they're asking for records, it's a fancy lawyer speak, ducis tecum, which means bring the records with you in Latin. Um, so if it's that, that's um, a request for records. It could be a, a deposition that they're asking for or to testify. Um, so those are the three main things that they're going to be asking you for. Ooh, those are all good. Uh, talk about the uh, difference between a deposition and testifying. Sure. A deposition is less formal than testifying. Um, you'll be in a room, similar to one we're in right now, just an, an office space, not in a courtroom, where lawyers on both sides will be asking you questions. It's basically to determine whether or not they need to put you on the stand. Do you have the information that they're looking for? Um, it's recorded, usually. I always recommend for our therapists to bring their own attorney um, when you get the subpoena. Uh, usually, your, I, I always recommend, especially if it's contentious, if it's custody, if it's divorce, you want to get your own attorney. And you can once you have that subpoena in hand, you, most of the time your liability insurer will assign you an attorney when you put in a claim for one. So you definitely want to do that. You can also call me. That's fine. Um, or email me. I got a subpoena. I can't review it for you. I can't review documents. That's another thing that consultations don't do. But I can walk you through it. Now, so, in your experience, you, it's interesting, your liability insurance, and a lot of people use CPH and, again, another uh, member benefit um, from being a member of AMFT, but I, I've never gone through this. So they will actually recommend an attorney for you. What what questions would you suggest? Because you you know you cannot give a legal opinion. What questions would you suggest in asking an attorney to make sure they are familiar, kind of with this turf? Because I think finding an attorney is similar to finding a therapist. Uh, you got to find a good fit, and necessarily the first one you go to may or may not. Uh, be the right one for you. So what do you ask a potential attorney that you are interviewing to represent you? Sure. The um, CPH, I believe they assign you one if you're putting in a claim. So I, I think you're very limited if you want to go through them on who you get. Um, but if you want to pay for one yourself, that's, that's fine as well. Uh, you want to make sure they understand the therapist client privilege. That's probably one of the biggest aspects because you're going to want to, if most therapists are like, I don't want to testify. I don't want to release my records. Um, although the records belong to the client, not to the therapist. And we'll get to that. But um, I don't I don't want to release it. My client doesn't want me to release it. Um, you know, you've already spoken to your client. They said, no, I don't want you to send my record over to, let's say it's a, uh, they're suing their employer for a wrongful termination. I don't want you to send my record to my employer's attorney. Of course, I don't want that. So when you get a subpoena, if you get one, I get one, anyone gets one just living their regular life, you have no choice but to respond. In to, writing, right? In writing to give the information that's requested of you if you are subpoenaed by the, it's not by the court, it's usually sent by an attorney. The court, it's a court process. Well, let's talk about this. Because mm -hmm. I've gotten some, I've gotten one in the past. These are common scenarios. So you've worked with a couple, mm -hmm. um, the relationship did not work out. Now you you may be currently seeing them, you may not. In my case, I had not seen them for about two years. They're going through a divorce and a contentious one, and you get uh, a subpoena to turn over the file. But the notes, um, and we'll talk about personal notes versus therapy notes, are written with both clients, but you only have one party's consent. 
do you have to turn over uh, that file? If, even if the lawyer is telling you to, if, if, if you know your rights, if, if it was a couple therapy and only one person is consenting to release that? You cannot. Under standard 2.2 of the Code of Ethics, it explicitly does state that when it's couples, group, or family therapy, you need written authorization from every member to release records to or any information to a third party. You can't even acknowledge they're a client. Um, and if you only have the authorization of one, I mean, you can attempt to redact, but really you're going to redact basically the entire thing except for the person who signs its name. There's really nothing else you can provide. And yes, a client is entitled to their record. And I always explain it to our therapist who sometimes can't really wrap their head around is, yes, they're entitled to theirs, but they're not entitled to the other person's. They're not entitled to their spouse's, their former spouse's, family member's record. They're only entitled to their own. So you need authorization from everybody to release the whole thing, to recognize that they're a client. Okay, so the lawyer maybe should know that, but they're, they've in that scenario, they have sent me the um, subpoena. So what, I have to respond in writing. So what do I do knowing I know, I know the law, I am not allowed to do that, but the, the lawyer is saying I need to do that. How do I respond? Well, if you have hired your own attorney or gotten one through your liability insurer, you're going to tell the, the your attorney that you want to claim therapist client privilege. That's that's the key. If your client's like, no, I'm not going to sign a release, whether it's one member, whether it's just your cli- individual client, um, that's that's what you need to do. You need to make sure that they know that you claim this privilege. And that's one of the exceptions to a properly served subpoena. There are very limited, like I was saying, anybody gets a subpoena in your regular life, you have to respond. You have to, even though it's coming from an attorney, an attorney can't dictate law, it's a court process. So you have to abide by that court process unless you fall into one of the very few exceptions. Therapist client privilege, doctor client privilege, um, clergy client, uh, you know, the proper term for it, cler- privilege, spousal privilege, those very, very limited, very specific privileges that can be claimed. And the privilege doesn't belong to the therapist, it belongs to the client. So if the client says, I don't want you to release any information about me, then you say, I'm sorry, I'm claiming therapist client privilege on behalf of my client. And you tell your attorney that, and your attorney will, should be able to put in a motion to quash. And basically, motion to quash means your attorney goes to the court and says, we're claiming privilege. We cannot abide by the subpoena. The subpoena should be thrown out. And hopefully it will. <laughs> and no guarantees. can you also, in this situation, again, reference the AMFT code of ethics around that? Good. Absolutely. I always tell therapists if they have any trouble conveying any information, I always say, you know, blame it on our code of ethics. I'm trying to imagine a situation where, okay, you would be called to testify in a situation, again, around couples therapy, I guess, if both people consented. Um, But the other thing I I often think, and when I'm training young MFTs, is to kind of inoculate, kind of bulletproof yourself against this early on. What if you have in your own paperwork, whether you're in a group practice or private practice, uh, as far as what you will do and what you will not do, including testifying in court, offering things, does that help you legally if your client has had an informed consent before and they sign that they realize you are not going to have any involvement with the court if you do it kind of in the front end? Or is that just, uh, will that not hold up legally? That will not hold. Okay. It's wishful thinking. It's peace it's, of mind. It is. It you know, and actually, that's that's part of the my at annual conference. I do um, a presentation on therapists in the court system. There's no need for me to do ethics. Everybody else does ethics. The ethics committee does a presentation. So I'm like, okay, let me let me tackle some legal issues. That's the most I get. I I got subpoenaed by my client's um, employer by my client's husband for records and I put in my informed consent well that's great because that party that subpoenaed you isn't part isn't party to your informed consent there's really no way to avoid it if your client's attorney says no we need these records of course your client can say hey 
give me my records. And you say, okay, here you go, because it's theirs. Um, but more often than not, you are the person who's subpoenaing you is not a party to your informed consent, has no idea that you, that you're, that, that client agreed to that and probably does not care. If your, if your client asks you for their records, let's say there's no subpoena. So sometimes, uh, clients may be slightly deceptive on what they're going to do with the records. Do you need to have them, what is your advice for best practice? Should they make a request in writing? Do you need to know what they're going to do with those records or does it not matter if they want them, they want them? It's more if they want them, they want them. It's once they have them, they, it's up to them. They can do whatever they want with them, give it to their attorney, post it on line, whatever they want to, you know, whatever they want to do with that, that's up to them. Um, the code of ethics doesn't require requests for their own records in writing. I recommend it as good practice, have them sign off on it, put it in their record that they requested it and that you gave it. And cause it can't hurt. I'm always about documentation, you know, keep a record of, of what your client is asking you to do and is asking you for, um, there's a very high bar exception to limit access to records for a client. It's based on compelling evidence in exceptional circumstances. You can limit access. It doesn't even say that you can withhold all access. Um, and I usually tone that very, very high bar to potential suicide. Um, I don't think there's any, I haven't heard any other situation where it's like, will it upset the client? Okay, well, that's not that's not good enough. Will it harm the relationship between you and the client? Unfortunately, that's not good enough either. It, it's that really high bar. If they read this, they're going to go off the deep end. They cannot read this. That is something that falls into that exception. But other than that, under HIPAA, federal law, they're entitled to their record. What in that file? Now, to, again, to for best practice to make sure I'm legally up to snuff, so to speak, what should be in the file, the minimum acceptable in that file? It's funny that you say that because it's, it's not really well established what that is. Our code of ethics said, says records should be adequate. That, that's all it says. It doesn't say, oh, you should have, these are the list of things you should have. It's not even usually embedded in state law. I suggest you check your state law to see if they say you must have a diagnosis on every page. California probably has something wacky, uh, but it, it's probably very not very well established. Even HIPAA doesn't really say what they have a vague list of what's considered medical record ish, what it would be included, but there's nothing that mandates that you have that information. So it, that's a very, I get that question a lot. It's very hard to answer. It's, it's kind of what you think is accurate. That was the other word, accurate and adequate. So when I think of it, I think of some, you know, your opening paperwork, some type of, uh, you know, demographic form and informed consent, say uh, a treatment summary, which has goals. But I think the big question we always have, especially because some therapists have converted to everything electronically. Some people still write a, old-fashioned case note and their own chicken scratch. What about how do we distinguish a progress note from a personal note? And what is kind of best practice on that uh, about if you do keep personal notes, where to keep them? Sure. And that is a HIPAA thing. That is uh, very much a HIPAA federal law that governs that. So they do not define what they call psychotherapy notes. That's the legal term. There's the medical record and there's psychotherapy notes, which is a very, very specific definition on the HIPAA website, privacy rule, footnote 47, if you want to know. Uh, that's where you can find the actual definition of what a psychotherapy note is. So basically, clients are entitled to the medical record under HIPAA, except psychotherapy notes. Um, those don't have to be released to the client, but in order to release them to anyone, you do need their permission still. And the number one thing is it needs to be kept completely separate from the medical record. If you put, if you write your chicken scratch notes during a session, notes to yourself, comments on whatever it is, and then you stick it in the same folder that has that treatment plan, it is not 
a psychotherapy note and it's part of the medical record. It's like the toothpaste is out of the tube. You can no longer separate it and put it back in. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You cannot take it out later yeah. on. It, once it's in there, it's in there. Um, but you also have to consider it has a long list, the definition of what it's not. It's not treatment plan. It's not diagnosis. It's not billing. It's not start and stop times. All of those things, medications, if you, if you know of any. It has a long list of what's not, not really what it is. It kind of vaguely says the conversa- if you take notes on the conversation that you have in session can be considered psychotherapy notes if they're not all of these categories and they're kept completely separate. Another question we get a lot kind of related to that is MFTs or systemic by nature or expanding, talking to collateral context in what we call the indirect system. So uh, many times, you know, you have multiple releases. So I'm curious what your idea or your thoughts are kind of from a legal perspective as far as releases, maintaining them. Is it just a blanket release? Yeah, sometimes releases have particular deadlines on them when they expire and then what the release is for is is it a broad release or is it just for treatment collaboration is it for notes what is your uh, tips as far as how to maintain and have accurate releases of information i always recommend to our members to be as specific as possible and release no more than necessary. HIPAA requires you releasing no more than necessary. I prefer specific over broad, because if you, if your client has asked you to give records or to, you know, you can talk to my mom on this issue. I actually had one that, I don't know if you know that Washington just changed their law where 13 year olds can consent to their own uh, mental health treatment. Yeah, well, I didn't know that. Yes, uh, 2019 just passed. There was a release to talk to mom for a billing and uh, scheduling issues, appointment issues only. And mom wants to know the medical update on on the minor. I get a lot of minor questions too. Yeah. A lot of minors is probably this huge, huge questions that I get because it's so complicated. But that release was very specific. No, you can't give that to me. Now that 13 year old has their, their own right. If you have the right to consent, you have the right to release records. They kind of go hand in hand unless law says otherwise. So it was very specific. So it being that specific helps the therapist know what they can and cannot do for their client. It tells them, you know, I'm, I'm letting you talk to my attorney. Okay, well, are you just letting me talk to them? Are you also letting me release records? Are you letting me, you know, are you only having me talk to them about, oh, you were in an accident? Am I only talking to them about the therapy revolving around that accident and not everything else? Um, I always, you know, keep it specific. Building on that, so let's say I am a family therapist and I am working with lots of teenagers and their parents. So I am framing it as a family treatment, but built into the family modality, there are individual sessions with the teenager, there are co-parental sessions, and I always have my clients kind of sign a, uh, in my paperwork a no secrets policy, meaning I don't want to be handcuffed. At, uh, uh, if one person meets with me and say, hey, you know what, I'm having an affair, but you can't tell my spouse. I mean, so when you're dealing with something like that, is how important is the modality, is how you define the treatment versus if I was just working with an individual and that was my, my uh, main modality and then maybe from time to time I would expand the system to bring in a, a family member, but I started that therapeutic contract with that individual versus starting with a family. What are your thoughts on that? I'm so glad you asked me this question. This is probably, I get this a lot because it's very hard for MFTs because what I've learned over the past three years is that MFTs think so systemically, they don't necessarily in the moment see the ethical complications that that roll into that. If it, no secrets policy is, is key. If it's family therapy, then it's family therapy, even if you see them in an individual session, if it's family therapy, you still need written permission from every member competent to sign a waiver. So the minors, you'd have to check your state law. Most states it's 18, some it's 16. 
and then you have the outliers, Washington at 13 and California at 12. Um, yeah, 12 years old. Consent to your own medical treatment, uh, mental health treatment. So, How many is that? I know you don't know every state, but that, that seems very early. Are, are, are more states making that trend to enfranchise youth at an earlier age to give consent? I, I didn't think so until I just heard about Washington. I, it, California was the only outlier, um, and they have, but they have very specific, they have three different laws that are very specific around that issue. And Washington just passed this one where it's just a very simple law. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, if any court cases come up or some guidance from regulatory agencies might come out um, since it's a brand new law. So we'll see um, how that goes. But when you're treating a family or you're treating a couple, it's good to have no secrets policy because that's them signing that is your ROI, is your release of information. Um, if you have, they're signing off to your informed consent that has that in, in uh, no secrets policy in it, and they're agreeing to it. You know, every now and then, go ahead and remind them. <laughs> I think this is important too in, in our code of ethics. You can have someone sign something, but it is is the ethical responsibility of the therapist to also explain that. You know, if you have a mound of opening paperwork and you know, the client is just rushing through, that is a a paramount thing to talk about to build into your opening. Spiel. It would, would seem also like times to uh, em employ a lawyer would be when you get subpoenaed, but also when you are starting your practice or even a, a group practice to have a lawyer look at your paperwork. Would you think that's a good idea? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I can give you generalities of what should be in there for you to draft it and then have an attorney, uh, a local attorney, review it and make sure it complies with state law as well. Um, but the the um, the code of ethics also requires you to explain it, not just have it in writing. Uh, it also does require you to explain anything revolving around confidentiality. Um, I, I also recommend the idea of privilege because privilege is a specific court. It's it's a little bit different from confidentiality. Privilege is what they can claim when it comes to the court system. But then having if you're doing individual therapy and you have a third party come in you have to make the decision am i now doing couples or family work if i am i should be closing that individual session and opening up or that different file client. different paperwork completely everything completely different brand new if they are coming in to supplement they come in once, maybe twice a year, and you see this person, you know, two times a month or whatever it is. They're only coming in to supplement that individual therapy. I always recommend have them sign something where they recognize that they're not a client, they're not, they don't, they're not entitled to the confidentiality, and the privilege that is held is held remains with the client and not with this individual person. It should be explained and it should be in writing. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I'm big about in writing, but everything in writing. Have it in writing that I recognize I'm not the client. This other person's the client. I'm not entitled because we get a lot of cases because we you know the AMFT ethics committee hears complaints. We do accept complaints from the public and from other uh, fellow therapists and members of ethical violations of our members. And we do see that. We see when the therapist is like, this person wasn't a client. And the person's like, I, I was in therapy. Of course I was a client. Because it was never explained to them, you're just supplementing. I'm not treating you. Um, and, and absolutely have it in writing. Because once you have it in writing, even if the complainant tells us, I was the client and they did X, Y, Z thing to me, isn't that awful? Um, you should punish this therapist. And the therapist, you know, where we say, oh, my goodness, that would be absolutely awful if this is true. It's always if this is true. And we send the, that member the complaint, and the member sends back, here is my paperwork showing. She recognized that she wasn't a client. It was explained. She read it. She signed it. Oh, okay, then. Then the ethics committee will take all that information and, and make a decision from that. You're saying so much good stuff and my ADHD is taking over. <laughs> so let's, why, if uh, AMFT gets a complaint uh, from a client about a therapist, 
you know, because you have AMFT and then you have your state regulatory or licensing yes. board. How does AMFT interface if the complaint comes first to AMFT? Do they kick it back to the licensure board or will AMFT handle it independently of the licensure board? She will ask the complainant if they have filed at the licensure board because the licensure board has most licensure boards have more of the ability to investigate these complaints than we do because again it's just me <laughs> whereas licensure boards do usually employ investigators to deal with it if they f if they do file the licensure board we'll put ours in abeyance until the licensure board makes its decision and then once it once that the licensure board makes its decision we will then send it to our ethics committee to review um, if they were disciplined if the licensure board found there's nothing of this, most of the time we'll close unless um, we think the licensure board made the chair of the ethics committee. It's not my decision. Makes a he thinks like this is a glaring error. There's something wrong here. We still need to hear this. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll close it. Um, sometimes licensure boards can be a little slow, and sometimes. Uh, Either complainants will just not file with the licensure board. They don't want to because a lot of the times they're still very attached to their therapist. They want them to get in trouble, but not too much trouble. So they'll go through through us because we don't affect their ability to practice. Or they just didn't know about it or they don't want to for whatever reason. Or sometimes they pull it from the licensure board because it takes so long. Our ethics committee meets once a year to go over cases so sometimes they'll be like i pulled this from the licensure board because they're they were taking too long that does happen sometimes um or if it comes from canada who doesn't have licensure in most states sometimes they can put it through colleges um sometimes they can't uh, sometimes we get some international ones as well the scenario last week where i had been working with a client for several years. They started as a minor, but now they're 19. The parent had access before because everybody signed the consent and the teenager was begrudgingly uh, open to that. But now they are, you know, 19 years old. And what happens if the parent calls and wants to know, either wants paperwork or wants to know what's going on in that therapy? Whereas it was kosher when they were a minor, but now it's not. How do you handle a situation like that? That happens a lot because once they turn 18, that magical line gets crossed. I mean, the line has to be drawn somewhere. And once they get that, then that power moves automatically from the parents to the now adult client. Um, I would recommend having a discussion about it definitely with the parents and the minor, hopefully before that 18th birthday hits, if, if at all possible and say, okay, well now you, you guys don't, you need, uh, now I need written permission from this adult to give anything to you, to let, give you an update. So you're no longer entitled to that. And most states, you'd have to check your state law, but most states that would include anything before they were a, you know, one, cause it's not that 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 record is still that client's the record isn't the parent's record they just the law deems the minor not competent enough to consent to their own treatment to release records but once they magically turn 18 they are now competent of course that's debatable depending on the person and course. sometimes it's interesting because <laughs> um, i was supervising this case in a scenario just like this where the the now, adult did not want their parent to know what was going on in the therapy, and the, and the parent was, I'm paying for the therapy, so I at least need the records, and and it doesn't work that way. Um, and that's a discussion you have to have with your son or daughter about the payment of the therapy, but you cannot release that without consent. Yeah. Okay. Should you get new paperwork when, when someone crosses the threshold to 18? Should you get new paperwork? You wouldn't necessarily have to close everything. That would be up to you. If you feel like, okay, let's let's close the minor case and open this new adult case. That's up to you if you want to do that. But to have new paperwork, new consent forms, I would say that that would be a good idea because otherwise you still have the parents consenting to this treatment and not the adult consenting to their own treatment. So yeah, I would recommend that. Um, it's funny that you mentioned the billing because I get a lot of the time 
I get the questions, well, it's family therapy, but this person's insurance is paying for it. So it's their record. No, no. Bill, you know, who's on the forms for billing is completely separate from who is your actual client, who owns that confidentiality, who owns that privilege. It's not necessarily always the person who's paying that bill. They're not magically entitled to the record just because they're paying the bill. Knowing this, these are in that informed consent talk, in addition to your paperwork, these are things you can certainly bring up, especially if you're dealing with a lot of systems like this where you have emerging adults or teenagers and parents. Um, one more, I have not been able to stump you yet. This one comes up a lot as well. So I've seen a couple. The therapy has ended uh, maybe shortly after the couple's therapy has ended, or it could be a year or so. The, the, yes, the individual says, hey, you know what, we had a good alliance and connection. I don't want to tell my story all over again. I'm not with so-and-so anymore, but I would like to see you. Can I come in and see you? Uh, how should a MFT handle that? Uh, I, I knew that was going to be your question. Uh, I get that a lot. And again, because MFT sees things systemically, they don't see it necessarily necessarily any issue with that. But I've also seen many complaints on this issue where the person who's no longer the client puts in a complaint that this is an issue because this therapist knows everything about me and now they're treating my former spouse. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, because ethically, right, your loyalty is still to the original. You you have to care. Even that client you're not seeing anymore, that was the original unit of treatment. So yeah. that's, do you have to, what would you tell us? Do you have to, if you haven't seen that other party, the one that doesn't want to see you, you know, I don't want you to tell my ex that I'm coming to see you again, but how do you, how do you handle that if you want to see people? Because a lot of us, yes, MFTs, the, the nature, we're relational. We're not trying to hurt people. We want to help somebody that we had a good alliance with. Should I see them or not? I would say most likely not and to refer them out unless you can get acknowledgement and, per and permission from the other members of that client unit. Otherwise, you fall into uh, the standard 3.4 of a code of ethics is the general conflict of interest. Will it impair your clinical judgment? Will it uh, increase the risk of exploitation of the client? Same kind of thought process for multiple relationships. You could probably throw it into that bucket as well. It's not, a, it's not an automatic no, but there's a process. You can't automatically say yes either. There's a process you'd have to... I would say always say get in writing, make sure the client, the, the whole member of the client unit knows that this is happening and that, and is okay with it because you will know all this information about the couple and to you, that might seem like a good idea. And to the client, the individual client, they're like, oh, well, you already know everything about me. I don't have to start over. But then there's this other person that you owe duty to or these other people, if it's a family uh, session that I'm um, a specific case I'm thinking of, it was family. And then the therapist saw an individual after. Um, and then one of the members of that family found out months later and was just completely hurt by it. Um, so there, there's no problem with referring uh, clients out, referring people out. That's, you know, everybody says they're worried about continuation of care, but that is continuation of care. Sometimes the clients will be like, well, I'm not going to go see anybody if I don't see you. Right. Or we live in a small town. It's hard enough to find you. I mean, it, it's very, uh, I think, frustrating for clients when, when they want help and they feel like they have a good connection to you and, and you can't tell them. So one of the ways, and I don't know if this is uh, good or not, like, uh, but, you know, some therapists have termination paperwork and it's great when a term uh, when you can plan a termination in therapy but realistically that doesn't necessarily happen for all of our clients so what about having termination paperwork that lets the people consent uh, should either person want to be seen individually in the future in this case of a couple that that's okay with the other partner again is that more for your peace of mind, but does it hold, hold up legally? Or because I've heard some therapists starting to do that when the termination is planned. So you, you talk about um, the possibility of seeing them in the future again, and, and that would be the informed consent of, you know, once this couple's therapy is over, that 
the it's new paperwork, new file, and that the other spouse or partner has no more access to the work. If, if you have something like that in the termination of the couple's therapy, might may that help you? Could it work? Yes. There, there's something in there that an ethics professional, not even legally, pulls at me saying, you can't require it. You can't put it out in front of them, make them feel like they're obligated to let you see their significant other sometime in the future by themselves. Is it a possibility? Yes. Yeah, that disturbs me a little bit because then you, we can still get a complaint later on that says, I felt I, was, I had no choice but to sign that. And after the therapist started seeing my former spouse or whoever, again, I realized I wasn't okay with it. You know, people can always withdraw their consent. Even release of records, they can say, you know, tear that up. I withdraw my consent. They're allowed to do that better again in writing, but they can do it verbally. Um, so, yeah, I'm not the biggest <laughs> fan of that. Can you do it? I, I guess. Um, I would think twice about it um, just because you could get that. All I, you know, all I want to do is, you know, please my therapist. They've been so good to me. Okay, I'll sign it. And they're not actually comfortable with it. And you're doing it with the other person in the room. So they, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're not really sure you're going to get the right answer. So yes, when in doubt, re refer out. Um, yes. And this has been so great. Uh, the, uh, it's the last question I had. If we have, is we have a lot of students. This this podcast would be great to be, you know, used in any kind of legal or ethics class. Uh, I'm going to use it in mind, but want to know a little bit about the student ethics competition, and uh, I think that's a a good way because if you were early in your career, it's like these kind of iterative skills. You could be a great helping professional and be empathic and whatever. But if you are not good at paperwork, if you do not as I said, inoculate yourself from some of this. I mean, those are your biggest complaints. And nobody, even if your heart was in the right intention, in the right spot, it doesn't help you if you are legally not complying. So I think learning early and staying on top of things is, is very important. Like I said, I like teaching an ethics class just because it does help me think about my practice. And I learn by just staying on top of stuff and from talking to, you know, experts and good people like you. So tell us about the ethics competition. Sure. It's, it's wonderful. My predecessor started it. Uh, we've had four so far. I don't know when this podcast is coming out. We might be in the midst of our fifth by, by the time this is heard. Um, so every fall, we the ethics committee creates a, a hypothetical. Sometimes it can get a little, a little wacky, a little crazy, uh, but all very realistic. Nothing too far out there. Although if you've listened to The Shrink Next Door, nothing's out there, too far out there. Um, Give us the example from 2019. 2019, it was a family, I believe it was family therapy. There, it was an uh, indigenous family. Uh, so you had that uh, cultural aspect to it where the therapist, there was, there was issues of possible breach of confidentiality, uh, we we usually also have a supervisor issue in there where the supervisor has done something either right or not right because it's not always find all the things that's done wrong, but we also want you to find the things that were done correctly. Um, there was a duty to report issue. There was um, confidentiality issues. So I get, I get the scenario technology. and then I can work as a team with my friend or my cohort or do I have to do it individually? Tell us then yes. how, how they uh, sure. apply to it's a, you can It's teams of two or three. So you can be two or three and we have the master's program and um, the PhD. And you work in groups of two or three and you write a response, five pages, nothing huge, nothing out of this world response to the hypothetical we have some prompt question general prompt questions and then <clears throat> it's graded by current ethics committee members as well as former ethics committee members and current and former judicial committee members so they're all clinical fellows um, and our one public member uh, he loves doing it mm -hmm. um, and you know just names probably that you would recognize grading these papers and they love they absolutely love doing it 
and there's first, second, and third place winners. Um, as of right now, the first place winners, it's such a great prize. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed that this is the huge prize. In addition to, there's a little, there's a little bit of money, but there's also you get a trip to annual conference, flight, hotel, and re- conference registration paid for. Uh, you get acknowledged in on the website, um, all all three categories of winners. And at annual conference, you get recognized at one of the keynotes. Um, 2019 was was wonderful. Uh, some of the winners brought their families, and it was just it was. It's cool, and I know a lot of educators, as I am one, I have my foot in that water and my foot in the private arena as well, but a lot of educators are building it into their syllabus uh, and their assignments because it's great, thought-provoking anyway, and it's like a two-for-one. You've done the work anyway. You might as well submit. So, uh, yeah, it's a great thing that AMFT has added. Stephanie, I cannot thank you enough. This has actually been fun. I mean, this is not a, you know, it was a free-flowing conversation, but it's it's stuff every MFT needs to know. Um, and I think we, we covered a lot in an hour. So tell us again um, how people can get a hold of you. It's 24,000 plus members and just one Stephanie, but she is <laughs> great. She will get back to you. Tell us again, uh, if you are a member, again, students get the ethical preclinical fellows and clinical fellows get the legal and ethical consultation. How do they do that? Um, the best way to get in touch with me if you want a phone call is I have a website that's linked to my calendar that you can book a call with me. It's www.aamft.org slash book a consultation. Made it really simple. And then you have a choice of a thir- uh, of a 30 or a 15 minute call. And then you can pick a date and a time and it automatically links to my calendar and it'll set you a reminder, set you reminder emails and all of that. Um, or you can ask me your question directly via email and it's simply just ethics at aamft.org. And um, I'll probably be going and answering some of those this afternoon as well. When this airs, I predict a spike in your, your <laughs> flow. How, how long does it usually take to one of those phone calls to get in? Um, Oh, goodness. Mondays are probably my busiest. People tend to book me over the weekends. Um, I also, you know, I book out, have to book my lunchtime is already (laughs) blocked off. Otherwise, they would take me the whole day. Usually, you can book uh, 12 hours in advance. Um, You can also call me, um, although the voicemails tend to be the, the the whole phone tag back and forth usually doesn't work as well. Yeah, online booking is definitely the way to go. Or send me the emails because when a call ends early, I can get to the emails. Um, that's that's also a very good way to do it. Um, it. It's not like it takes, you should be, I mean, during annual conference is probably the only time that that's an issue, but it doesn't usually take that long to, to you can usually get within a day or two. Yeah, it is quick. There. And again, it's, I always think it like, it's like AAA. You know, you pay for it sometimes. You, hopefully you will never use it. But if you need to, it's there and you're glad you had it. And I'm glad we had you on the podcast today, Stephanie. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Eli, back with you. Lots of important information that hour. Some, I hope, will keep me out of a court setting for the remainder of my career. And some of that information... Uh, vital when you're working with the intricacies that is systemic therapy when you have multiple people in the system, whether it be couple or family therapy. As I mentioned at the open, Stephanie has uh, ended her tenure with AAMFT, but she uh, gave us so much to think about there. And the new associate legal counsel is James Punelli. So membership has its benefits, as you hear me say each and every edition of the AAMFT podcast. If you are a member, you get access to the, as we mentioned in the interview, the the legal and the ethical consultations. And as was mentioned, you can go straight to um, the website and sign up for a time and a consultation. I think of it as like AAA that hopefully you'll never need it, but if you have it, You'll be glad you did. You can go to amft.org, the membership tag, benefits, and then you'll see the ethical advisory opinions. Everybody at every level of membership gets that. 
And the legal consultation goes out to clinical fellows, allied mental health professionals, preclinical fellows, and pre-allied mental health professionals. Also, you can go under that tab on the website and see legal and ethical fact sheets. AMFT has compiled a ton of information, many of which we hit on in this hour, but into a deeper dive. Things like subpoenas, understanding privileges, choosing your practice, joint custody in the minor, getting started in private practice, duty to report child abuse, no secrets policy, how to keep good clinical records, and how to terminate treatment, and much more. So these legal and ethical fact sheets, another great member benefit and can uh, take you deeper into what we highlighted this hour. Here at the AMFT Podcast, we strive to give you useful information like this and bring you interviews with industry leaders and pioneers. You can follow us on Twitter at the AAMFT and I'm at Dr. Eli Live. I like to listen on Apple Podcasts, but you can listen on things like Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you like to listen to your favorite podcast. We really appreciate the star ratings and the reviews. You can reach me directly if you want to send me an email at info at elikaram.com. It's E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M.com. Please stay safe out there. And until next time, stay systemic, my friends.